Okay, let's start. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to International Telecomagrant Round. We have some difficult technical difficult issues today. We're going to start the, the meeting today with a case being presented by Qatar, by the Hamad Hospital, Dr. Hamed Fahid Hanzi, the Trauma Care Fellow. It's also being uh, presented by Dr. Uh, Ruben Peralta, San Rizzolo, and Hussein Abdelhaman. Dr. Uh, Ahmed, thank you for preparing the case today. Looking forward for a great presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Antonio. On behalf of the Roma team, I'm a hand in front of the and Dr. Rizzoli, and Dr. Hassan, the leadership of the organization. I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to present a difficult case. Yeah, the title of the presentation is a difficult journey. How did Thank you very much, Dr. Rubin. Uh, I'd like to thank the uh, Pan American Trauma Association for inviting us to give this presentation. Uh, so, as Dr. Rubin said, uh, my name is Ahmed, Trauma Critical Care Fellow at Hamad Medical Corporation. So, before we start, uh, I'd like, like to state that we have no actual or potential conflict of interest in relation to this presentation. Uh, the objectives of uh, today's case is uh, to discuss and emphasize the importance of uh, timely diagnosis as well as management, and also to emphasize uh, to keep a high index of, of suspicion, especially when the clinical progress of a patient differs from the given history. And lastly, uh, to elaborate on the consequences uh, of in in inappropriate resuscitation. So moving on to our case, uh, our patient uh, was a 52-year-old male. Uh, the alleged history was that he was getting off a stationary bus when he felt dizzy and fell off the steps of the bus on, onto the road. Uh, he was this he was taken from uh, from this site to his workplace first aid clinic where uh, on assessment he was unconscious. Uh, the only obvious injury he had was a laceration on the foot. Uh, he was also tachypneic and tachycardic and uh, blood pressure was was within acceptable limits. Uh, the other finding that they noted was that he had a very high blood glucose level of more than 33. So with, with these findings, they contacted the ambulance service, the EMS service, who arrived uh, to the scene within about 20 minutes. When the EMS crew arrives on scene, they find a patient who's unconscious. His GCS is 7, labored breathing. So they, they decide to proceed with uh, rapid sequence induction and in intubation of the patient. Uh, during this time, they noted that the patient is severely hypotensive. Uh, as you can see on, on the box on the right, his blood pressure readings throughout uh, this uh, resuscitation period gradually uh, keeps dropping. Dropping. Uh, so he's started on resuscitation. He receives around one, one and a half liters of crystalloids, and he started on vasopressors. He receives boluses of phenylephrine and then noradrenaline as well. Because of the instability, there was a, uh, there was a delay of almost two hours on scene by the uh, EMS crew, and they considered uh, they uh, considered in initially to take him by ground ambulance, but because of the instability, they dispatched the helicopter, and the patient was transported by helicopter to uh, our emergency department. So he arrives around two hours uh, later to the ED, but he's taken to a non-trauma area in the emergency department. And from his medical records, we uh, the the team were able to identify that this patient was uh, a poorly controlled diabetic. Is also hypertensive and recently treated for pancre acute pancreatitis almost a year ago. So on the assessment, the patient is severely hypotensive. His blood pressure is 65 by 45, and he's in severe metabolic acidosis, pH of 7, uh, lactate of 4.8. Uh, his blood sugar readings are still sky high, uh, 30s. So at, at, in, given this, this, this findings, the initial uh, thought process was that this patient may be uh, in sort of DKA or hyperglycemia. So he was uh, he was managed initially managed in 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 that direction. So he was started on aggressive fluid resuscitation. At the same time, he was also on uh, he required dual vasopressors. On uh, the initial labs, it also showed that he had a hemoglobin of six point five. Uh, although there were no obvious signs of hemorrhage uh, on uh, initial ass assessment of the patient, an ECG was done, which showed no ischemic changes. His chest X-ray was normal. He had a fast uh, examination repeated multiple times and it was negative uh, on all those occasions. A focus of the heart showed an empty heart, uh, and re re rectal, rectal examination did not reveal any uh, fresh bleeding or melina. Uh, the rest of the labs, as you can see on, on the box on the right, did a high WBC count. He was in 
AKI's creatinine was elevated, Trop T's was also elevated, and his creatinine kinase was also ele elevated, six, 696. His coagulation profile at that point was within acceptable limits. This was his uh, initial chest X-ray and pelvic X-ray, which were uh, interpreted to be normal. Uh, so at this point, the, the differential diagnosis of the emergency department team was uh, firstly hyperglycemia because of his high RBS. Uh, secondly, they, they considered sepsis because of his high WBC count. And they also considered heat stroke because the patient had a high uh, creatine kinase level and he was also working uh, outdoors at the time. Uh, it was in the middle of the day and the local temperature at that uh, on that day was 45 degrees Celsius, which is around uh, 113 Fahrenheit. So that was one of their differences as well. But given his uh, significant hypotension and low hemoglobin, they did also consider hypovolemic shock. Uh, at this point, his ABGs start deteriorating, his pH drops below seven, his lactate is now uh, shooting up. His hemoglobin, which was initially 6.5, is now 4.8. Uh, so it's severe metabolic acidosis. Uh, at this point, he's intubated, but he's not on any sedation and he has no response. His GCS is 2T at this point. So a CT head was done by the ED uh, team, which turned out to be normal. There were no signs of traumatic brain injury or any other uh, uh, hemorrhagic or ischemic uh, findings. Uh, the examination at that point showed two small abrasions on the right groin. Uh, and during this resuscitation period, the ED team were about to attempt uh, to insert a femoral arterial line on the right groin, prior to which they did an ultrasound of the groin, which showed a hematoma uh, at, on the right groin. So at this point, the patient has received almost seven liters of fluid from the EMS crew, as well as the ED resuscitation team. So at this point, which is around five hours since arrival of the patient to the hospital, he's referred to our team. Uh, we were consulted, and when, when, we assess, when I assess the patient, uh, we have a patient who is non-responsive, his intubated GCS of 2T, uh, and he had no, uh, no, no reflexes, his pupils were fixed and dilated, and he was severely hypotensive on, on uh, noradrenaline infusion. Uh, the examination of, of uh, the initial examination revealed a soft swelling on the right groin, uh, uh, but no obvious sign, other signs of hemorrhage. We repeated the fast scan EFAST as well, which were again negative. At this point, the patient is also aneuric. So we have a patient who is uh, in, yeah. So I'd, I'd like to open uh, the questions now. I'll ask the panel, what would you do next in this case? So Antonio, I'm just going to ask uh, uh, some questions. Uh, we have to ask uh, ladies first. Um, Tanya, are you there with the married one? In the group. Uh, Dr. Lini, could you comment? Uh, any ideas, any suggestions? I, I kind of missed the beginning. I came in a little late, so I'm just give me a okay. chance to catch up here. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Madrigal? Any suggestions and comments? What do we do next? Queremos con este caso. Doctor Tania mentioned that it's, it's difficult to hear, um, uh, you know, the case. So if you can just repeat how the patient is now. Oh. Yeah. Uh so just to summarize, we have a patient who was uh, uh, supposedly fallen, uh, he fell down, a station, fell off a stationary bus. Uh, he was severely hypotensive post-fall uh, with a very low GCS intubated by the EMS crew and taken to the emergency department and uh, managed by a non-trauma uh, section of the ED where he's managed as a case of either uh, uh, heat stroke or diabetic ketoacidosis and he started an aggressive fluid resuscitation. Uh, after which point they noticed that he has a drop in hemoglobin, worsening acidosis, uh, and a, a large hematoma in the right groin. So this is where, where we're at right now.
Dr. Supra, you hear the, um, the message of the... Yes, the yes. Uh, yes. Thank you. I, I heard the case, and I think this is a very difficult case. So you have a patient with a persistent hypotension after falling from the bus, and uh, the cause is maybe a multi multifactorial in this patient. Uh, I think that the first thing we have to rule out bleeding in, in this case, because the history was trauma. And uh, the source of bleeding now that I'm concerned is uh, maybe the pelvis. He may have like minor pelvic fracture and a lot of pelvic bleeding and pelvic hematoma. And you have a uh, swelling and hematoma on the groin also. So uh, I think in, in this case, I would uh, try to, to rule that out, but the patient is not stable enough for uh, another CT scan, I guess. So maybe the, the best bet is to, to bring him to the OR, uh, especially if you have the hybrid one and you, you can uh, do the pelvic angiography and maybe embolization of, of the bleeding vessel. Or if you don't have that, uh, maybe quick uh, preperineal pelvic packing may uh, contain the bleeding uh, if, you, if you do it and if there's bleeding in the pelvis. And the second thing I would assess is his uh, cardiac pumping. Uh, I guess you did some uh, cardiac ultrasound already. We have to rule out a uh, non-hemorrhagic shock like a cardiac tamponade or maybe other heart problems that we may have missed. And the third thing uh, that we haven't assessed yet is uh, his afterload. So uh, in this patient, I think he, he needs uh, more lines and maybe kind of output monitoring. I mean, after we rule out the bleeding, uh, he has to be in the ICU setting. And uh, you think about sepsis, so you give uh, him a lot of vasopressors and maybe antibiotics also. And in this uh, situation, I may consider uh, giving him some steroid to, to help with uh, uh, the sepsis and maybe to treat uh, possible adrenal insufficiency. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Super, for great comments and comprehensive comments. Any papers, any other uh, colleagues from the group that want to comment? Do you, do you have an x ray yet? Yeah. Yes, we do. Yeah. Uh, right this was the initial x ray, and it was interpreted to be normal uh, at the time. Okay. Any other comments? Any other comments? So, so if I may, it's challenging, right? Because we're told now this is five of the works. The patient has a three year old event. He fell from the station that he was going to the doctor. He fell at that point. He's 52. He's not bad. He flew his off the roof. And he's in a very hackable in the shock. The difference is now we have the hematoma on the thigh on the right groin. There was, uh, it doesn't look that big. But, but again, our team went there, saw this patient. The first thing they, they said is the fact that Dr. Super put it correctly. This patient needs an appropriate resuscitation. Hemoglobin is poor. This patient is bleeding somewhere until proven otherwise. So we moved him to our trauma bay and started resuscitating him. So just to go back to Dr. Super's uh, point, uh, we did the focus uh, of the heart at the time. Uh, his uh, contractility seemed fine, but it was. There was evidence of uh, hypovolemia. It was an empty heart. And there was no evidence of a cardiac tamponade at that point. So uh, we took over the patient. This is at five hours since arrival. And we began our aggressive uh, resuscitation. Uh, massive trans transfusion protocol was activated. He received, uh, as per our uh, uh, hospital protocol, he received six units of packed red cells, six uh, platelets, and six uh, units of plasma. Uh, in addition to fibrinogen and PCC, as well as uh, bicarb replacement. And at this point, he's on noradrenaline infusion. Uh, following this, uh, shortly following following this, he did respond. His blood pressure uh, stabilized transiently. The systolic went up to 160s and diastolic to 68. Uh, however, his, his uh, blood tests were deteriorating. His ABG is worse now. And now his coagulation profile, which was initially normal, is now becoming deranged, an hour of 1.6 from 1.1, uh, low fibrinogen, and his rotem was also deranged. Uh, so uh, since he had stabilized uh, transiently, we did decide to move to a CT scan. We did a whole body CT scan, and this was the, the cuts of the abdomen and the pelvis.
yeah so uh so as you can see here uh, there's an obvious fracture of the iliac crest there's a displaced uh, fracture there with a large hematoma on the lower abdominal wall which was extending all the way down to the groin and in the delayed phase we could see pooling of uh, contrast within this uh, hematoma so that was uh, where he was bleeding uh, so, and this was uh, what was reported, a displaced right iliac crest fracture, right inguinal hematoma extending to the abdominal wall with a blush within, and fat stranding of the mesentric root and evidence of shock bowel. So I'd like to uh, uh, put the question back, what would you do next in, in, at this point in time? Any takers from the team? Let's start with uh, parties of the super. Uh, if uh, now we can locate the bleeding point, and I I still uh, stick with uh, the same approach. I think uh, angiography and nebulization may, may help uh, stop bleeding in this patient, and uh, without uh, to do any open surgery. But if you don't have that or you fail embolization, I think maybe uh, exploring the right groin and try to find the bleeding vessel is the option also. Thank you very much. Any, uh, yeah, I mean, does he have like a compartment there? Is is it yeah, tight? No. Like his compartments were soft at that time. You know, because uh, I mean, he's got a very, you know, I guess Angio is probably the approach. You know, it depends what, obviously how sick he is, how quick people can get to him. But, you know, there's always exploration if, you know, he's so unstable and deteriorating quickly if you if you have to. But Anjo's the approach if he's stable enough. Good, uh, thank you. I know Dr. Carlos, when I go to get joined, I probably know uh, you know, this is a piercing that is follow up on the, the boss. And Sevilla uh, had already came out about five hours or seven hours to a front bay. And you start resuscitation with a CT and a scan, and you have a blood in the pelvis. And then I will proceed now with um, IR. Okay. So uh, at our center, we uh, we are quite lucky to have the IR team uh, immediately at our disposal. So that's what we did. We took the patient immediately to uh, the IR suite for uh, for angiogram and embolization. So uh, at this point, he's receiving the, the second shipment of MTP uh, and his coagulation profile is worsening. His acidosis is still bad. His INR went up from 1.6 to 2.4. Fibrinogen is, is significantly low. Uh, and we also did the platelet mapping assessment, which showed that he required platelet re re replacement. So uh, he received an additional uh, 2,000 units of PCC, more bicarbonate and more fibrinogen platelets and continued uh, noradrenaline infusion. So the initial, uh, the angiogram, this is what we found. Uh, see the internal uh, iliac and the external iliac with no obvious blush at this region. But when we proceeded uh, downwards, uh, further down, uh, there was an active uh, blush from a branch of the femoral uh, artery on the right side. So what our colleagues did was they the they coiled a this branch of the femoral artery and additionally two uh, terminal branches of the external iliac and they also uh, prophylactically uh, gel formed the right internal iliac artery so this uh, towards the end of the procedure he's now re started to receive the shipment of uh, massive transfusion uh, protocol uh, most pcc is given his B blood pressure stabilizes upon uh, embolization of these these vessels his re his vasopressor requirement is dropping and the remarkable thing is that uh, his gc has started improving uh, from he went from fixed dilated pupils to bilaterally reactive pupils and he started localizing uh, but there was a new event at the end of the procedure uh, he had about a massive bout of fresh, uh, br uh, bright red blood per rectum. His uh, numbers are still pretty bad. ABG is still deranged. Coagulation profile is still deranged. Uh, he's still anuric as well. So with, with this, he was shifted to the trauma ICU. It is now about 14 hours since arrival to the hospital. Upon arrival to the ICU, there's no major change uh, in his clinical status. But we did notice that his, his bilateral lower limbs uh, were 
are pale, cool, and swollen. However, the right was more than the left, and the pulses on in both limbs were not palpable below the popliteal pop arteries. Uh, we consulted our vascular colleagues at this point uh, who assessed the patient, and uh, on a Doppler assessment, they were able to get a triphasic signals on uh, on bilateral uh, distal arteries. So they opined for, uh, for conservative management and observation. Shortly after this point, the patient has another bout of fresh bleeding per rectum. We did uh, a local examination and endoscopy was done, which did which ruled out any local cause of uh, bleeding. Uh, our GI team was consulted as well, but they uh, they rec recommended against colonoscopy at this point. So we decided to proceed with a CT angio uh, to see what's going on. Uh, at this point, he's still quite sick. ABGs. He's still in the severe metabolic acidosis, pagliopathic as well. So the repeat CT uh, the abdomen with angio showed uh, evidence of ischemic left colon uh, and shock small bowel. However, the interesting point is that his uh, inferior mesenteric artery was patent and uh, the bilateral external iliac as well as the femoral arteries, which uh, up to the level that was uh, uh, available to us in the pelvis, were both patent bilaterally. So but the next question is, at this point, what would you do? I think um, Dr. Ruben, are you, it's hard to hear you. Are you talking to me? Yes. Oh, perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. No, just um, um, thank you so much for this presentation. This is so interesting and stimulating. It's good to see everyone. Um, a quick, a quick question I had though, is when the patient was in angio for the pelvis, was there a squirt of, did they interrogate the celiac SMAIMA at that time? I mean, it's sort of a moot point now. You have your CT angiogram, but yeah. I am worried that you're going to have to explore and probably resect whatever is dead on from your, your colon, um, because that's certainly a source of uh, ongoing metabolic acidosis. Thank you. Thank you, Ruben. Thank you. So, uh, no, they, uh, they did not... Uh screen the uh, celiac or uh, proximal to the uh, external iliac. So we didn't have that information at that point. Dr. I mean, does, does he have a compartment syndrome in his leg now? Uh, we did, yes, uh, uh, we, didn't, we did not suspect a compartment syndrome at that point. Uh, his, uh, he, we were, our thought process was that he has a global ischemia, given that he was on a uh, high dose of uh, visopressors, uh, and his bilateral, both limbs were cool and pale, uh, although uh, the, the right one did seem a little bit more uh, edematous than the left, but compartment syndrome at that point was not uh, one of our uh, considerations. Dr. Zuma. I think that... <laughs> The situation now is uh, very difficult. And uh, since now the bleeding part is uh, in the GI tract, so I would take him to the OR for some interventions. Uh, I, I think I would uh, put him in the lithotomy and maybe starting with uh, intraoperative colonoscopy. Uh, maybe I, I'll, I'll call my colorectal colleague to, to do that. Uh, so they can confirm the point of bleeding and maybe assess the ischemic uh, of, uh, of the colon the ischemia of the colon. And if I find some uh, treatable lesion from the scope uh, by surgery, I would uh, do the uh, laparotomy and resect, like uh, Tanya mentioned, resect uh, whatever is dead or bleed out uh, of this patient. And uh, I don't think about uh, doing definitive anatomosis at this, at this point. So I, we have to advise the patient about uh, the risk of uh, colostomy. Thank you. Great comments. Any other comments from the group? If, if I may, again, yeah, okay. I, just, I, I, I like the big picture, right? Okay. So let's just remind. So this is a 52-year-old man, diabetic, trivial trauma for seven hours. He's under-resuscitated. For seven hours, he's bleeding and, and under-resuscitated. So finally, when we're called, Again, the team described that this patient looked dead. 
Right? When they went to see the space, they, they thought the patient was gone. Right? But they still said, no, we're not going to stop. They brought the patient to trauma, aggressively resuscitated, identified the source of bleeding, and went for an embolization. Right? And this patient has two bouts of bright red blood per rectum. And I might be saying, well, this patient doesn't stop, right? It's one thing after the other, after the other. And then we take him back to CT scan, and uh, what the CT shows that maybe he has an infarcted colon. So again, I, I completely agree with uh, with Dr. Super and the comments from other. Right? This patient has to has to go to the OR, right? So something needs to be done. Uh, mm -hmm. Colonoscopy again. Talk to GI, and GI was very against it. They said, "Look, with all this blood, we're not going to see anything." Yeah. So we're going to proceed. So at this point, the patient is very sick. Uh, his severe metabolic acidosis, his lactate is rising, and we've got evidence of a dead bowel. So we take him to OR uh, urgently. We do a laparotomy, and this is what we found. We didn't find too much blood in the belly, uh, just a copious amount of serosanguinous fluid, but his entire sigmoid colon up to the mid-descending colon was, was dead. It was uh, gangrenous. So this segment was resected. Uh, since the patient was unstable, we just packed his abdomen and closed him temporarily and took him back to the ICU. So we dissected almost about 20 centimeters of, of colon. Uh, he was taken back to the ICU soon after, and at this point, he's even thicker than he was. Uh, he's on three vasopressors at this point, and uh, his lactate is, is actually worsening. It's, it's 12, 13, now it's 23, and he's pr progressing to multi-organ failure. His, he was an AKI when he came, now it's worsening. His aneuric, his creatinine is rising. Urea is rising as well. His liver functions start deteriorating rapidly, and his coagulation profile is worsening at this point. So he's, he's quite sick. And in addition, he was also requiring high uh, ventilator settings as well. The, the following day, we uh, we took him back to OR for a relook. Uh, we the only thing we found was slightly uh, unhealthy or uh, dusky-looking uh, descending colon, which was resected. Again, we performed damage control a laparotomy and temporarily closed the abdomen and took him back to the ICU. On day three, he's worsening. Uh, he has he goes into cardiac arrest and is revived after eight cycles of CPR. At this point, he's still on three vasopressors. However, his pupils are still reactive. On this day, with, when we examined his leg, we noted that he had developed new ischemic patches on the right lower limb, on the thigh, as well as the leg. And it looked appeared mottled with blisters, and crepitus as well. So it was a uh, picture suggestive of necrotizing fasciitis. So given these findings, we rushed him back to the OR for debridement. But when we opened up his leg, this is what we found. We found dead muscle all the way down from the hip to the ankle. Every muscle was, was either dead or dying, but there was no evidence of an infection or, or necrotizing fasciitis at this point. So at this point, the patient is very sick and we, we had an MDT uh, meeting with uh, surgical colleagues and critical care colleagues, and we decided that proceeding further with uh, amputation or debridement may, uh, may be futile in this case, so it was decided to uh, abort the procedure at this point and take the patient back to the ICU. Unfortunately, uh, uh, as, as the, the, day, the day progressed, he deteriorated further, and he went into uh, asystole and was declared dead uh, on day four of admission. So we we open for the discussion again. Um, uh, most of um, our colleagues have submitted Dr. Super and the other ones, and I'm sure Dr. Tanya has uh, made a remarkable points of the progression of the potential progression of this uh, condition. So we're going to start with uh, Dr. Gaynor. Okay, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's a horrible case, very difficult case. I mean. You had you they brought you in late and you know once the patient starts in that delayed resuscitation cycle and then you start resuscitating and reperfusing, you know, it's very difficult. Everything starts can start dying. It's un you know, you you can see it, you know. I just think one thing I would say is that. You know, when these people are in shock with these like extremity bleeds and everything, that you know, these the muscle can die very quickly, even if it's even if like the pressure's not super high, because you know, 
it just becomes a, a ischemic due to the the inflows into the muscular compartments is not very good on the pressors and the increased pressure so i mean but it's almost you know they it's in sometimes almost impossible to catch up when everything's going wrong you know yes yeah uh so there were two things that really summed us about this case was one was why did he in fact his sig sigmoid colon his ima was patent there was a uh, yeah. and the other thing was was the limb why, uh, yeah. why did he in fact his entire lower limb Dr. Supra, any final comments and how else we can go? Uh, yes, uh, I agree with Dr. Lini in that uh, this is very hard case and maybe impossible to save. And this is Dr. Lini's kind of case <laughs> in, in Miami. And uh, the, the only thing that I think I, I would have done in this patient is giving him a steroid and test uh, for serum cortisol because he may have some uh, form of adrenal insufficiency or maybe it will benefit uh, him if he has like severe sepsis as a cause of uh, the hypotension. But I think you did your best to to this man and uh, not, nothing to uh, to regret. Thank you. You see the um, neocortical and the CPCs is so fast, not facing like that. I know he's maybe compensated because his blood sugar was more than 34. It was extremely high. But uh, we didn't see any sign of infection at that time. But I think this is something to consider. Dr. Tang? Thank you. This is, um, I really appreciate you for sharing this difficult case with us. And I applaud your hard work. I think your your team has highlighted some of the, the very important points about even if the story sounds like it's minimal trauma, that trauma is trauma. And, you know, you didn't give up on the patient in terms of you brought them over to the trauma bay. You repeated the ABCDEs and you did engage in aggressive resuscitation. This case actually reminds me of a case that I had with Sandro. When Sandro, when I was like maybe a PGY1 or two, we had an elderly patient who fell. The pelvic x-ray looked perfectly fine. Until we did the pan scan, and this was even before the era of pan scanning everyone, the patient had a tiny chip off like the, the pubic ramus, the superior pubic ramus or something with a massive blush. But you couldn't tell by just, just looking at the bony pelvis. And it really made me appreciate how, even though this patient isn't, isn't by age being 52, not elderly yet, it's uh you can I know you can be duped by a normal appearing pelvic X-ray, and the timeliness of the early pan scan, uh, with contrast of course, and of of course Dr. Ordonez and our colleagues in Colombia have been advocating that even for patients that are hemodynamically unstable. But the other thing we've been seeing in Chicago from time to time is with these massive resuscitation patients, like maybe even post ED thoracotomy, they come back. We're seeing Sandro and Ruben, this interesting hyper reperfusion injury once you get blood flow restored. And we've actually had to do fasciotomies where there's no extremity injury simply for that. And Ed Lenin alluded to that too. Um, but basically, you've lost your watershed area, areas like your sigmoid colon and anything that became reperfused uh, kind of declared itself over time. But, you know, it, it might have been something to consider is interrogating your extremity compartments early on. If you truly have no pulses to the extremity, that dead tissue has to be removed in a timely fashion. But this is a really fascinating case, and I, I again applaud your very hard work and and doing your best and not not getting trapped in sort of any trauma nihilism with this case. So congratulations, thank you. Yeah, thank you, uh, uh, Tanya. I just wanted to highlight um, uh, the great surgeon has a great heart. You are one of them. You recognize what you were doing when you were in. You were, uh, you know, um, 
enhancing career and doing your trainings and, and the professional development. And I think it brings us to a case uh, today that we did the first M&M &M today with the World of Peace. And he also was, uh, you know, George of course focused and, and uh, you know, recognized some, some, you know, high of suspicion of any kind of minimal clinical trauma that can produce a devastating effect. Especially, as Dr. Lin mentioned, in a delayed resuscitation, when you are a refractory shock, it's, it's really difficult to catch up with this kind of result. So, and then see a few on the, on the phone. So the reason we brought this case is not because we like to show uh, uh, our failures, right? We, we don't, we really don't like. It's because we're trying to understand this case. So when we go back, there are a few things that you should know. One is the history is not exactly what they told us. It looks like that this patient was hit by a bus. Not that he fell from the bus when he was walking to the bus. The second thing, when we review the pelvic x-ray, the radiologist can see a fracture. Nobody else can see the fracture, but the radiologist can see the fracture. So that was there, was present. The history was different. The uh, pelvic x-ray was there. And I don't quite understand, how did he infarct the sigmoid colon? We know the CT scan shows the IMA completely patent. And the sigmoid colon. There's so many arteries going into the sigmoid colon. What happened there, right? And then also, why did he infarct at his leg? So I think the leg is maybe a little bit easier. Maybe it's a combination of everything else plus some iatrogenic, uh, iatrogenic injury caused by interventional radiology, who embolized a, a branch of the femoral artery. But, uh, but again, I wonder what, what happened. We saw this patient going from, from normal to hypocoagulable, and now we have all this hypercoagulable uh, evidence on him, all this thrombosis happening on him. So what what do you think? Why why did he infarct his sigmoid code? Let me let me uh it's Enrique. I'm sorry, but I was on a call early on, but um hearing this last part of the case, one was the fractured side of the pelvis on the same side of the infarcted uh um uh, lower extremity. Yes, 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 same time. Okay. And and therefore, the, and the sigmoid colon basically can sit right in the middle. Was this possibly the area where the bus actually hit him in that area? And if it did hit that area, almost like a crush, that could explain both, you know, sigmoid uh, uh, in, a sigmoid injury that then went on to necrose, vascular shearing and uh, shearing, which caused you know, vascular um, thrombosis and the pelvic fracture is the only thing that I could think of other than some metabolic uh, reason. Mm -hmm. Great. I just want to let uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Dr. Bouchard, that was uh, participating in the first operation, uh, to see the distribution of the uh, uh, ischemia of the colon. Thank you for inviting me to this with uh, uh, Actually, the trauma was on the right side, but the sigmoid, the left side, the left floor of the size, the sigmoid, there was more than the size of the trauma. It was like uh, probably a water chip. However, the extent is quite bigger than the solid spine of the space. So it's like the whole sigmoid and after the mid, mid uh, semi. So it's a reason a lot of the clinical of uh, you know, the expect in this case. That, that's one thing. They have thought that they listed all this uh, angiomalization and the, all the symptoms that we have today, but actually in the groin and the other side, the right side of the groin. And they said the most important that we have in the last exploration, we did in the museum region, which is not the distribution of the femoral artery. They say it looks like much more a global, uh, you know, what's the street for? Great point, Dr. Jason. Dr. Super? I think the ischemic organs he had a uh, maybe the result of a low flow state, prolonged shock, and maybe he has like intravascular coagulation, maybe he has DIC and small clots in uh, his uh, capillaries all over the body, and uh, the the part that had a uh, actually had a uh, ischemia maybe the part with a uh, a, a small collateral blood flow, 
and maybe he has also atherosclerosis from his underlying medical uh, problems. So multifactorial, like you mentioned. Thank you. I didn't hear it. I couldn't understand the. So, okay. yeah. The PCC that we used around more than around eight grams, five, five grams of PCC, 5,000 5, units. Uh, the INR was uncontrollable, went up, up to 2.4. The first time that we used it for second time, didn't bunch the number. It was around 1.8 from 1.7 after two grams. We realized that the pH was in the 6.8 range. And we know those factors do not work unless you have a pH around 7.1 or so forth. Now, my question is, that could be a contributing factor. Uh, DIC, a lot of PCC, uh, severe acidosis, and intervention in the um, endovascular and the endothelium with IR, that could, could, could contribute to a lot of uh, microthrombosis. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So, I mean, the the physiology of DIC is not only you know hemorrhagic. Yes. So and uh, and uh, again, as we raised here a few times, there are many colleagues that maybe this is DIC. Medication for PCC is DIC. So uh, again, we're using DIC, we're using PCC off label. Indicates this is not an indication for PCC. But again, too, we have seen so many other patients where we have given PCC, yes. and we yes. think that they they do have a good response. So it's one more thing for sure. I agree. It's multifactorial. There is uh, all the local trauma. There is all the hypocoagulable state, hypercoagulable state, and all the drugs as well. Yeah. Tanya? Thank you. Just a quick question. Um, what did the fibrinolysis pattern look like on TAG and on repeated sort of later TAGs too? Like, was he in fibrinolysis shutdown or hyperfibrinolytic or no, anything? No, no, it was not. Yeah, Thank you. Was, was making so one other thing that we use here, Tanya, is we use rapid INR. We took him from the vascular clinic because, you know, we don't wait sometimes for the tech or the rotten, you know, the 20 or 30 minutes to see the lysis. So we go by INR that is really correlated quickly. But as Dr. Ginsburg mentioned, you may get into the DIC, uh, uh, you know, or fibrinolytic shutdown without knowing because INR, we're not going to tell us that. And this is something that I think we're learning. And uh, we present these cases to um, uh, Kenji Inaba that was here. Also, he was puzzled. He, you know, he couldn't he couldn't find out what was the, you know, all of this, um, uh, you know, thrombosis that this patient, uh, you know, presented. And uh, just that's why we bring it to us to see how um, we can approach this patient the next time. But I think he came seven hours latest with us with a triple inotropes. And uh, with the hemoglobin all the way down to 4.8, and uh, hepatorenal shut down already. So uh, we're just uh, trying to uh, make sure that the learning point is to expose our team to cases like this. And I really would like to thank you for all of your input. Any other comments? Dr. Martos? Any comments from Brazil? Uh, 
I think Dr. Martos had to go back to the OR. Okay, great. Anyhow, so without, we're approaching uh, 55 minutes. Uh, on behalf of the trauma team, Dr. Rizzoli and our team, I uh, remember Dr. Hushan, our trauma fellow, Dr. Hassan and myself, we'd like to really to thank you um, for the opportunity to share this um, case, learn from your inputs that I think are pretty close to what we are thinking. And also, uh, you know, probably um, see that compassion sometimes doesn't go doesn't go beyond the first impression of our trauma team with this patient that was almost a dead patient, you know, really pale. We had pupil fixed and dilated. And at least, unfortunately, um, due to the refractory shock and the hypovolemic uh, uh, ischemia, I stays almost global. Uh, he succumbed to this uh, this condition, and uh, I just we just want to say thank you, gracias, shukran, salam, and um, obrigado. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Great case. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.